This one's for the cash flow hunters. Granny Flats, Share Houses, NDIS, Airbnb. What should you be looking for if you're looking for cash flow? So firstly, I'm gonna get into Granny Flats. Um, I guess, typically speaking, if you're purchasing a property and you're looking to add the Granny Flat on at a later timepiece, what you're gonna find is most of the time, that's gonna come at a negative equity point, particularly if you're buying in an area which is say, sub $1 million mark, it might cost you $200,000, $250,000 to build that granny flat, and you will probably only increase the value of that home by 80 to $120,000. The second thing to consider if you're doing that is, you're now making that property the ugly duckling of the street. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's only a certain type of people that are drawn in to buying a property with a granny flat. And they are typically either investors chasing a higher yield or people living with older parents, potentially the older parents, retirees are living out the back, or you've got older kids, late high school years, university, so they wanting to have their own space. So more often than not, you're going to be putting off a large segment of home buyers in the future that may not want your property. On the flip side to that, you're also gonna be putting off a potential a large amount of renters, you know, whether it's to live in or to rent. You know, some people might not want the weirdo who lives in the back in the granny flat by himself out the back there. You can't let your kids or your dog run around because you don't really know that person. So that's a bit of a negative draw card for me. For me, with the amount of equity it costs or capital it costs to go out and build that granny flat, as long as you've got the capacity, you're always going to get a better result going out and buying a completely freestanding property, not only will you probably get just as much, if not more of a rental return, you will definitely get more of capital growth and you won't be setting yourself back in terms of an equity point. Where granny flats do become, I guess, a useful part of your strategy is more towards the back end of your, I guess, your property acquisition phase. If you've finished purchasing more property, potentially you're tapped out from a borrowing perspective, but you have access to savings or capital right there, well, that's when it may become a cash flow play. So at that point, you're no longer really caring about your capital growth. You're interested in increasing your cash flow. So you may have two, three, four, five properties. You can't borrow anymore, but you've got capital there to go and, and I guess enact on those granny flats. Then it becomes a strategy where potentially you may want to build those granny flats and start to work into cash flow. But normally speaking, people are actually foregoing, I guess, growing their wealth and it will slow down your uh, your uh, cash flow if you're doing it too early on in the piece. So, I mean, we can have a look at it here as well. For me, when I look at a property like this, we've got that self-contained unit. We've built that property there. Now, if, if I really want to talk about cash flow, what's going to be better cash flow? Me getting an extra two, three, four hundred dollars a week, if that, depending on where you've, if you've got a loan to, to put that granny flat up or whether you've stumped up the cash, or would you be better off dropping you know, a couple of, well, not a couple, but 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 doing the subdivision and selling off that piece of land because people need to remember that the capital is also cash flow. Though you may not be getting it on a weekly basis, that capital is cash in hand. That is still just as good, if not better in most cases than the cash flow itself. The next part I wanna get into is share houses. So uh, I'm pretty big on this one. So in terms of share houses, some things to consider is there are a lot of modifications done on a share house. So we can kind of see a bit of a floor plan here. In most cases, on a proper share house, you're gonna have bathrooms in all of them. You're going to have extreme tenant turnover. So what I mean by that is if you've got four, five, six tenants in that property, it's going to be more likely than unlikely that you'll have one vacancy at most given times. One comes in, one goes out. It's very, very active type of asset to hold. You're also then going to be having much higher property management fees. You're not going to be getting your six, seven, eight, nine percent property management fees. You're going to be closer to that 20 to 25 percent management fees. And then your wear and tear is going to be significantly higher. You know, you've got potentially five or six times the amount of people using the place. They may be bringing friends over at certain points as well. So expect that your maintenance and upkeep is going to be much higher. Typically speaking too, you may also be having them, you may be paying for the utilities on that site. Uh, yes, you will inbuild that into your rental uh, increases, 
But again, it's just something which you kind of don't really have full control over. But the other one is it's actually a lot harder to pull equity and get fair bank valuations on those properties as well. Because again, banks like to see comparables. They're all about mitigating their risk. How many other share houses are there likely in the local area near to you? So getting a fair rental appraisal, like how can the evaluator come in and go, well, yes, you've got five bathrooms here. I'm going to increase the value of that by an extra $200,000. More often they won't. And then in terms of releasing equity, again, the lender may only go up to 70 or 80% in terms of an equity extraction on that property as well. So you may get trapped equity. So again, for me, it's a very, very hands-on asset. Um, I like my assets to be more passive investing. And, and I guess I'll, I'll dive, deep dive into that in a little bit more as well in a moment. Then we go into NDIS properties. So I guess first and foremost, the one thing I wanna make is that I think NDIS properties are fantastic for I guess the social impact and I guess the gap that they feel in society. But what I don't like about them in particular is more the builders that have been exploiting it over the past couple of years. There's a lot of government grants on the home building stage. So what we've seen over these last few years, particularly during COVID, we've seen lots of builders come in trying to snatch up those grants. And now there is this long pipeline of NDIS properties about to flood the market. So don't, don't be surprised if you purchase your NDIS property and your tenant that you thought was about to move in, potentially they fall sick, potentially they have a change of heart, potentially they move to another location that you're left with a very, very unique, and what I mean by that, we can kind of see through here, we go through the pictures, you're gonna to have to, uh, depending on what disability you're catering to, and that's another big thing to consider, you may have to lower the benches, you're gonna to have to get wider doorways in and wider hallways, uh, completely unique modified kitchen and bathrooms. So this is an expensive refit, it's expensive maintenance and upkeep. Um, I have, seen plenty of horror stories on the investment forums online of people bringing in tenants um, and a lot of damage has been caused. So again, for me, it's a very, very risky asset. Um, you can get high yields, don't get me wrong, but the risk to a reward ratio on vacancy and maintenance is a big no-go for me. And again, going back just like the share houses, very hard to get fair bank evaluations because there aren't a lot of comparables nearby to you. And then the final one, um, and probably the one that I find the most amusing, is the Airbnb slash holiday home. So I speak with plenty of people who are weighing up, they wanna buy a holiday home, but also it'd be yeah, yeah, an Airbnb in the time they're not using the property. So I guess the first thing I say to people on this one is, <laughs> when and how often are you planning to use it? because what you're going to find with Airbnbs, they are extremely, extremely seasonal properties. When it is going to be booked is during school holidays, summer periods, public holidays, which is going to be highly likely when you're probably looking to use and utilize that property as well. During those other time periods, expect a, a high, high vacancy rate during those periods of time. The second thing that you've got to consider as well is the large fees. Not only is there fees taken by Airbnb from your bookings, you've also got cleaning fees. If you're looking to completely offload the management of that property as well, there's also management fees. And again, I've spoken to many investors who ended up turning their Airbnbs just into standard rentals because their time was taken away from them, I guess, managing that asset. It is, again, it's another property that's an extremely hands-on investment. When I speak with investors, there's two types of investors I come across. There's what's known as a passive investor. They want to buy their property, allow that capital growth to be the main vessel because we need to remember capital growth can be turned into liquidity, liquidity and cash flow, okay? If you get a property and it grows two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 over a couple of year period, even with the selling costs, even with your capital gains tax that you'd pay on selling that property, more often than not, you're going to outperform the cash flow you'll get on one of these hands-on type of investments. So for me, that's why I won't go down this pathway because I'm time poor. I've got children, I've got a partner, I work a lot, and that's what a lot of our clients and a lot of people do. So for me, these kind of investments are for people who have free time, they're happy to dedicate their time to be able to take on these kind of investments. 
But my other counter argument is, is that if you weigh up, will you get a better return from you potentially working an extra day a fortnight? from you taking up a course to upskill yourself to get another promotion and increase your income and in turn increase your serviceability and get yourself into another asset. More often than not, if people focus on their main revenue drivers and get stronger at that, they'll get a better return, not only in the short term, but also the long term, because a lot of the times these type of assets are like running another side business. Guys, my name's Julian, I'm the Head of Strategy at Ripe House. If you do have any questions, feel free to leave a comment on the comment section below. We'd love to get to it and do another video. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. We'll be sharing a lot more data-driven content on there as well. And we do have a big announcement coming in the coming months. So please make sure to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next one.